Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Midway. And we're so grateful that you are here and uh, with us this morning to worship. Uh, if we have any guests, uh, we'd love to have the opportunity to meet you and visit with you. And if you have an opportunity to stay around after our worship service, uh, we'd be grateful for that opportunity to meet you. And I always want to invite you uh, to come worship with us here at Midway. Uh, this morning, our congregational singing will be led by Kelly Sims. Our opening prayer uh, will be done by Philip Lawler. Our lesson by Mark Howell. Uh, Jeff Sparks will lead the Lord's Supper. And our closing prayer will be by Bill Hyde. Uh, Tommy Ayers wants to thank everyone for the thoughts, prayers, and cards. He continues to get better both physically and mentally. Um, he has moved, and his new address will be in the next week's bulletin. Uh, make sure that you get a copy of the bulletin so that you can stay up to date with all the things that we have going on here at Midway and also locally. Um, also, there, there are several prayer requests always in the bulletin that we can pray for during the week. Um, if you have an uh, electronic device, uh, whether it be a phone or a tablet, uh, please silence those um, at this moment so we can worship uh, without disruption. Um, just a reminder... Uh, if you did not get a Lord's Supper cup, uh, make sure that uh, you get one of those uh, before uh, we get to that time in our worship. At this time, we have no further announcements, and we'll enter into our worship service. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Join me in prayer, please. We're so thankful, dear God, that Thou art so wonderful and Thou art so merciful to human beings. Knowing, dear God, we are sinners and we do so many things wrong. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this nation that we live in. We have got so many problems. Thou know our problems. Thou knowest what we're doing. Thou knowest that how that we have actually decreased in our reasoning. We have become a very sinful people. We can read in the Holy Word where that the Israelites became very sinful and thou rejected them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will repent, the nation repent, but only the countries also around us, that they may see where they are and they can repent and serve Thee. Our dear God, we're mindful of the ones that have been mentioned or is in the bulletin. We're mindful of Brother Tommy Ayers and the many problems he's been having. We're so thankful for Brother Terry Ford. He could be with us. 
please continue to be with him. Mindful of Sister Hal, we pray for Mark's mother that thou be with her and comfort her, comfort the family. We're mindful of the little Norris girl, we pray, Heavenly Father, for the treatment she's going through. Be with the family and the loved ones with her. But, dear God, we're so thankful that George Jones could be with us today and be with him, continue to be with him. Knowing also that Roger Gray is also sick, be with him, help him get re restored with his health. Mindful of Sister Carrington that the problems she's having, we pray that thou would be with her, help her, dear God. Man, mindful of Lindsay Dunlap, we pray for the Father that help her through the problems she's having right now and that the child will be birthed and be speedily and be okay. And mindful of the Roy Odom and their family, they the problems they are having. There are many other people who sister, sister will cut, be with her, and help her get through this pneumonia. The other people that are sick we may not know about, be with them, bless them, and help them. Dear God, be with us as we worship Thee this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will sing these songs and it help us to spiritual uplift us. Be with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Be with us as the Thy Word is preached unto us that we may understand it and help us to feel, live better lives upon this earth. Dear God, there are so many things we are need of, but most we are need of thy grace and thy mercy. And to forgive us of our sins, in Christ's name we give thanks. Amen.
Good morning and welcome. We're glad you're here today. So thankful you've chosen to be with us. As you probably already know, and unless you're just a, a guest with us today, our theme for the year is my world, my life, and my hope. And last month we talked about three different H's. This month we're going to talk about three different P's, but all of those P's have to do with the family, and we'll be dealing with that each Sunday morning this, uh, this month. As we begin that this morning, I want you to think about the family. It's probably something that we cannot overstate, that the family is one of the things that helps society. Matter of fact, when I think about the family, I think about the family being the, the building bricks, if you will, of society, the foundational bricks of society. Because what the family does is that it shapes the character of human beings as they grow up into adults. And not only does it shape the character of the human beings, of children, boys and girls, as they grow into men and women, but the family itself is something that, that, that really and truly does something for humankind itself. It, it, is the, it, it uh, determines or defines the demeanor of humankind in general. And so... Again, it's uh, hard to overstate the, the value and, and the importance of the family in our society. As we think about the family, we go back to the very beginning of time. Now, we're going to come back to this in just a little while. But we know that when God created Adam, he looked and he saw, and of course he already knew what he was going to do, but he get, does this for our benefit he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so what did he do? He created a helpmeet. He created Eve to be with him. And as a result of that, he instituted, he founded, he put in place the first family, did he not? And so when we have that, we have a pattern, if you will. God has established a pattern. And again, hold on to that thought. As you see, the pattern for the family is going to be what we're dealing with today. But hold on to that, and we're going to come back to it in just a little while. Now, as I stated last at the beginning of the year, what we're going to seek to do is we're going to seek to see what the world has to say. We're going to see how it affects us, and then we're going to talk about our hope, my world, my life, and my hope. And so when we're thinking about the family, what does the world have to say in regard to the family? Now, I would suggest to you there are many things that the world has to say, and I can't talk about all of them in one lesson. But what I do want to do this morning is to think about four things that the world actually believes, it seems, in regard to our families today. Number one, the world seems to believe that marriage should be delayed. The beginning of a new family structure, marriage, uh, the initiation of that, that it should be Delay. Now, what in the world does that have to do with the family? Well, I know there's some legitimate reasons for marriage. One may never get married. We understand that. But the thing about it is, all too often in our society, the delay in marriage is not just because I want to wait until I get some on some financial footing, you know, that's pretty good or something like that. The delay in marriage of which I speak today is let's give it a running uh, a run before we actually start. Let's just live together. Let, let's just have a tryout period, if you will. And so we delay marriage from that standpoint. We, we fail to have the commitment. Sometimes you see that word tossed about in movies and things of that nature. We fail to have that commitment, but we delay the marriage. We want all the benefits of marriage without actually having the marriage itself. That's what our society, one of the things that our society is pushing today. You give it a trial run period, but what does the Bible say in regard to that? The Bible simply calls that fornication. Or if you're reading from a newer, later translation such as the ESV, it calls it sexual immorality. If you go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 at verse number 2, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And so we don't get to have a trial run at it and have all of the benefits of marriage and still be pleasing to God. We can't do that. 
In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, at verse number 9, we see the reason, or at least one of them, that we shouldn't do that. To these same people, he said, Do you not know that unrighteousness, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral. Now we've got a whole group there, goes on, adulterers and so forth. But that's the word we were looking at back in chapter number 7. The sexually immoral. What's going to happen to those? Well, if you continue reading there, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are in one of these trial run marriages kind of things, delaying the marriage, but, but having trying to have all of the benefits, the Bible pretty well teaches there that you can't go to heaven doing that. And so you have to make some, some changes from what the, bio, what the world has to say. Number two, the world seems to believe that marriage can be entered by anyone, by just anyone. That's what, you know, the, the, the general perception of the world, anybody can get married. If you don't like it, just get out of it and go find you another one. Now, there are a number of passages in Scripture that we could deal with when we think about the one major one, we go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse number 9. And there, when Jesus is asked in regard to this very question, can one marry and divorce and remarry, basically, what does He say? He said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, here we are back to that same word again, except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, it takes expert help to misunderstand that. For one who has been married to a person and just says, I don't like this person anymore. I, I, I don't want to live with this person anymore. So I'm going to do what the world is telling me to do. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to divorce and I'll just find me another one. Jesus said that's not the way it works. He says for one to do that, commits adultery. And you know what we already have looked at in regard to those adulterers mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 at verse number 9. They can't inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are a couple of other passages in relation to this that we need to think about. In the book of Luke chapter 16 at verse number 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now keep that one in your mind and go to Mark. And Mark's account of this, he says in verses, uh, chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so if you combine all three of these passages, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to find that there's... The, the, there's that one exception for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But as we look at it, either partner, either the man, the husband, or the woman, the wife, either one of them can initiate this. And if they enter into this marriage, enter into this idea of, of just anybody can, can be married, then, uh, hey, what does the Bible say? It says you are committing adultery. And so when we look at it from that standpoint, we see what the world has to say, but we've already noted some things today in regard to what the Word of God has to say. But then number three, the world seems to believe that marriage can be between two individuals of the same sex. Okay? As long as there's love, as long as you're happy, as long as, as you want to be together, that's what the world says, that you can have a family relationship now, there are multiple reasons why this view is erroneous and, and, and why it needs to be denounced and why it is denounced by God. And I'm not going to cover this one in great detail because we're going to, we'll actually look at that a little bit more in one of our future lessons in February and deal with it in a, in a little more detail there. But as we think about this one, it's being pushed, it's being promoted, it's being... Uh, normalized in our society. And, and if you disagree with it, then hey, you're ostracized. You're cast away. And you are the one who is the bad person. And so the world seems to think that. But again, 
we'll note in a future lesson that that is not what the Word of God has to say. But then, here's a number four. The world seems to believe a family can be formed by, uh, notice this, single, and I put that in quotation marks, a single individual. By single, I simply mean an unmarried individual. We, we initiate a family by an unmarried individual. Now, now, what do you mean by that? Well, please understand that what I'm about to mention has nothing to do with a single parent raising a child after the death of a spouse, or maybe that spouse has uh, left that person, or, you know, for whatever reason it may be. That, that's not what we're dealing with right here. There have been plenty of mothers who have been abandoned by a husband who have raised good children, and vice versa. There have been plenty of fathers who have been divorced, the mother left, or the mother died, or whatever, who has raised a good child. And so those, that's not what we're dealing with. But what we are dealing with is this. One of the new ideas that has caught on in recent years that continues to grow is uh, being a single mother by choice. That's what it's called. That's what people, how they refer to it. A single mother or a single father by choice. Okay? Now, now what that entails is this. It's the idea of a person who is not married choosing to have a child outside the bonds of marriage. To, to, to literally become pregnant and have a child outside the bonds of marriage. Now you already, as Christian, probably see some difficulty with that. How are you going to conceive? The growing trend doesn't uh, uh, involve, you know, fornication a lot of times. Sometimes it does. But it involves some things such as artificial insemination or in vitro fertilization. There's a company called Cryos. And, and this company, particular company, specializes in making these two things, this idea uh, of in vitro fertilization or artificial insemination, they, they specialize in making that happen. Now, according to their statistics, what they reported was that of all their clients in 2020, and that's the latest number that I could find, of all of their clients in 2020, 54% were women who were choosing to be single, a single mother by choice. 54%. Now, what does that mean? Well, they didn't give a total number but they did leave some clues. They say that they have around an 18 to 19 percent success rate per woman cycle. And they reported that in that year they had over 2,000 births, successful births. Now I'm no mathematician, but I did learn to count. And I did learn to add and do percentages and those kind of things when I was in school. And if I Got this correct in my numbers, their numbers add up to about 11,000 clients per year. And 54% of those is, well, let's just say it this way, it's almost 6,000 women who have chosen to be single by choice, to be a mother, to be artificially inseminated or in vitro fertilization. And that's just one company. One. 6,000. But I want you to think about something else that should be considered in regard to this. One of the major problems has to do with in vitro fertilization. When we think about it, it seems like a good option. But generally speaking, what happens is there are 10 to 15 eggs that are extracted from the female... And then they choose sometimes five or more of those eggs to fertilize. And then they will take one to two of those eggs and implant it into the mother. So that hopefully it will attach and grow into a child, grow into a baby, healthy baby. 
Well, let me ask you this. What happens if they only take two of five that were fertilized? What happens to the other three? Are they not babies? And as a result of that, what happens? We sometimes call it abortion. They just sometimes toss those away. Sometimes they'll put them, they'll freeze them and save them for a later date. Do you see a problem? From the Just from the standpoint of of the mother, being a mother without a father and choosing to be that way, there's some issues with that. But the way you get that has problems tied to it as well. But this is the world speaking to us. This is what the world is saying is good and, and, and we're encouraging people to do that. We're talking about our world. And so this morning, when we think about our world, our world has some, has some wild ideas, doesn't it, in relation to the family. Now, very quickly this morning, let's turn our attention. We can see how some of these things would affect us in our own lives, but let's turn our attention to the hope part. Does the Bible supply a pattern for the home? Now, you know that I've already asserted that in this lesson. Back in Genesis chapter 2, when God created man, it's not good for him to be alone, therefore he created Eve, instituted the first family setting. And, And so, does the Bible supply a pattern? It's easy for us to answer yes. Easy for Christians to say, well, yes, it it supplies the pattern, and then just move on. And when you begin to discuss this with people, with with those who are in our our world and in our society, who may be your friend, who wonders, well, what's wrong with having a two, a, 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 you know, a homosexual marriage or a lesbian marriage. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with, with having um, a single uh, parent mo- or a single parent mother by choice? What's wrong with these things? What is it that, that we need to think about? And so that's where we want to go in the next few minutes. You know, we're told in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse number 15 that we're to honor Christ and as the Lord as holy and always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you. Now, of course, that that has to do with our salvation and how we become a Christian and live as a Christian, but isn't living in a family, isn't living in these things a part of living as a Christian? And so we need to be able to answer. Now, let's go back. We're going to go back to the book of Matthew here in just a second, but let's think about something. The Pharisees, when Jesus was making the statement that we read in chapter 19, verse number 9, Uh, They had, as they had on many occasions, come to Jesus to to test Him. And and so, in verse number 3, they came up to Him and testing Him said, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, the question that they asked centers around the prevailing teaching of the day. They're basically telling Him, All right, now, which one of these two Jewish leaders, these two Jewish teachers, which, which one do you take the side of? There was one by the name of Hillel. Hillel was a man who was the grandfather of Gamaliel. You may recognize that name from the New Testament. Hamaliel, uh, or rather, uh, Hillel was the grandfather of this man, and he believed that a person could divorce his wife for any, any cause. He, he even And in some of the writing, basically it's this, even for burning the bread, he could divorce his wife for that cause. On the other hand, there was Shammai. Shammai was the more strict of the two. And he wanted to hold on to, to, you know, the, the idea that marriage is sacred and it is to be maintained. And, And so you had two basic opposite ends of the spectrum. So when they come to Jesus... Basically, what they ask him is this, which one are you going to side with? Who are you going to take? And and so Jesus does the smart thing just as he always does. Jesus, when he replies to them, he doesn't take either side. 
If you go back to the book of Matthew and look at verse number 4, there's something that is very interesting that we need to see. He answered, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? I'm not taking Hillel's side. I'm not taking Shammai's side. I'm just looking at you in the eyeball and asking you, have you not read? But let's focus on that phrase for just a moment. Have you not read? Jesus asked them that. Have you not read? When He asked them, have you not read? What is it that He has in mind? Read what? What what writing did Jesus have in mind? And if I were to put that question out this morning and ask everyone to shout out loud, you would, you would, everyone in here would get it right. Have you not read the Old Testament? Have you not read the Scriptures? Everybody in here would get that right, would we not? That's what he's having reference to. He's wanting them to know that there was a standard that was given. Now, the Lord almost always answered questions by referring His questioners back to the Old Testament. Sometime when you're studying through and you're reading Jesus and when He's tested by various people, notice how He points them back to the Scripture, back to the Old Testament. He says, go back there. And He tells the Jews back in Matthew chapter 22 at verse number 29, you are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. They had asked about the resurrection. And so he deals with the resurrection in the Old Testament. Now in his answer to the Pharisees, he said, have you not read? But there's another phrase that he uses in in, in the passage. Jesus used the little expression, from the beginning. Matter of fact, in the discussion that he has with the Pharisees on that occasion, he uses that expression two times. He uses it in verse number 4 and also in verse number 8. Verse 8 says, He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And so, we're not really wanting to address the idea of divorce at this point. We've already sort of done that earlier in the lesson. But what we do want to understand is this. There should be no difficulty in understanding what our Lord meant. He rejected every tradition. What the world was teaching at that time, what the religious leaders were saying, He rejected that. He rejected the customs that they had grown used to, that they had become accustomed to through the ages. And He says, in effect... You've got to go back to where the pattern was established. Now going back to where the pattern was established, we go back to Genesis chapter number 2, and what did we find in Genesis chapter 2? God made Adam. God made Eve. God said, be a family to multiply, to replenish the earth. If we were to go back and read all of the passages there in the book of Genesis, it was there that God established the pattern. And even when you go back to the book of Matthew, when you're reading Jesus where He talks about the idea of uh, of, have you not read, going back to the Scriptures, going back to the source, and from the beginning, He also inserts the idea that God said, for a man to leave his father and mother and cleave to his woman. That's the literal translation of it. The husband is to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife is the way it's said. But the word is male, leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his female, cleaves to his wife. That's the pattern that God set at the very beginning, is it not? And so when we look at it, yes, we have to have, help people understand that the Scriptures are authoritative. 
But one thing we have to understand as Christians ourselves is they're authoritative. And when we understand that, which most do, most of us know that God's Word means what it says and says what it means, and that God has the authority to do that. But then we want to do like the Pharisees. Well, what about what the world says about it? Can't we just take a little bit of that? God established a pattern. But here's something else I want you to understand this morning. Not only did God establish a pattern for the home, but we can know the pattern for the home. Now we've already said, you go back to the book of Genesis and you find it, but I want to focus on that word know. Do you remember what it said in the book of John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32? Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My word, you are truly My disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Within that statement, we understand that Jesus makes it plain, we can know the truth. We can know it. We can know the truth about salvation. We can know the truth about who Jesus was. And we can know the truth about God's pattern for marriage. We can know it. Where do we find it? Do you remember what it said in the book of John, chapter 17, verse number 17? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We can know the truth because we know the Word. We can know the truth about the family because the truth about the family is in the Word. Have you not read? And so we could spend a lot of time this morning dealing with all of those issues and, and teaching those kinds of things this morning. But why do we need to know and follow God's pattern for the home? I want you to think about something with me. Every time someone strays from God's pattern, bad things happen. Every time when people stray from God's pattern, bad things happen. Do you remember what Adam and Eve did? They departed from God's pattern by disobeying His command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that disobedience did what? Led to the introduction of sin into the world, did it not? And they're being driven from their home, the garden. What about the people of Babel? Babel. The people of Babel had the same command that had been given all the way back to Adam and Eve, multiply and replenish the earth. They said, hmm, we found a good spot here. Let's build us a big, tall building so people will gather around it. We'll all be together. And God said, that's not going to work. You've broken my pattern. My pattern was for you to multiply in families and replenish the earth. To go out and to spread throughout the earth. To subdue it, the Bible says. And they said, we're going to stay together. And God said, no, you're not. And so what did He do? He confounded their language so that they couldn't understand each other. And as a result of that, what happens? They were spread out. We could go on again. Both of those have to do with the family. What about King Saul? You know, he was impatient and fearful of the Philistines on one occasion. So he decided there was no priest present. He was waiting on Samuel to get there, but he wasn't there. Samuel's too slow for him. And so he decided he would offer the sacrifice in the place of a priest. Do you remember what happened to him? That's found in 1 Samuel chapter 13. In verses 13 and 14 of that chapter... Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which He commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after His own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince of His people because you have not kept the word God commanded you. What happened? Saul was killed eventually. His son Jonathan was killed, and the kingdom was stripped away from his family, from his descendants who would come after him. We could talk about David and Bathsheba. 
David and Bathsheba commit sin. We understand she, Bathsheba, commit, uh, conceives a child. And, and David is confronted by Nathan the prophet about the little ewe lamb. David said that man deserves to die. Uh, we'll get to the point. Nathan said, you are the man. What have you done? You've taken Uriah's wife. You've had Uriah killed. What's the result of that? What happens? Two things in particular in regard to the family. Verse, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. That's what I'll do. And that's exactly what happened. But in addition to that, he also said in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 15 through 23, that that child that was conceived would not live. And it didn't. The heartache brought on when the pattern for God's family was interrupted. And we could go on. We could deal with many, many more. But let's move forward into our day and time. If we were to go to the book of Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. Now I have it on the screen, but I'm not going to take time to read all of that. But it's that section where he deals... Well, let's just do it real quick. Probably be as quick. For Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their reward. Now, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. Their gosh, does that sound familiar? Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to them who practice them. If you look within that, I didn't take time to count it. Should have. Do you see the violations of God's pattern for the family over and over and over and over? And when you, when you really get down to it, you come to that last part and He says the ones who practice all these things deserve something. They deserve to die. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, verse number 18, he talks about the wrath of God that was going to be revealed from heaven. That's prior to what he said as he is beginning this discussion. The wrath of God. And when we talk about the wrath of God, when is that going to happen? Well, he continues his thoughts on into chapter 2, verse number 5. But because of your hard an impenitent heart. You're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. When's God's wrath going to be exercised? The ultimate is when we stand before Him on the day of judgment. As we think about the family and the pattern for the family, why do we need to follow God's pattern for the family? Well, it creates problems for us. We could talk about abuse. We could talk about children and, the, and how they're affected by the breakup of families and different scenarios in regard to the family. We can talk about how we suffer here. But it's most important because when we disregard God's pattern for the family, it affects our soul. Our soul. It affects us here, yes. And that those building blocks of the foundation of the society causes societies to 
go bad like we just read in the book of Romans. All of those bad things. But ultimately, it affects our eternal soul. That's why we need to understand it. That's why we need to know something about it. Now, two more blanks. I know you don't have that on your sheet this morning, but those who practice all these ungodly departures from the pattern that we just read, from God's pattern for the home, the point is they will experience the wrath of God. They'll experience the wrath of God. We don't say that gladly. We don't say that with malice in our heart. We don't say that because we want to see them suffer. We say it because they're going to lose their soul. They'll experience the wrath of God. And you know what? The second, Christians must never be persuaded to condone such wicked departures from God's pattern. Why? Because it affects the souls of so many people. There are too many in our world, too many in our nation, too many in our state, too many in our county, too many in our own communities who for, have forsaken the pattern of God in regard to the home. We need to be concerned about them. Enough that we'd be willing to do our best to help them to do what God wants them to do. Not only that, we have to teach our own children what God wants so they don't get caught up in what the world has to say in regard to the pattern of the home. Oh, there's so many other things. We'll talk about more. Uh, 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 we'll talk about the family more next time. Maybe you're here this morning and there's something that you need to make right in a public way. Maybe you want to become a child of God. Put your Lord on in baptism. If we can assist you in any way, come right now. As together we stand. Jesus is Lord, my
Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we come to you today as humbly as we can to offer up our prayers. And Father, we pray that you'll be with us in our mind's eye as we go back to a time in which your Son and our Savior died on the cross for our sins. Father, we thank you now for this emblem which represents Christ's body. And it's in his name. Amen. Again, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine which represents Christ's blood. And without contact of his blood, we can not be saved. Father, we know that he lived a perfect life on this earth and, and died without sin, save one, and that was our sin. Help us to remember him and his sacrifice as we partake of this. In Christ's name, amen. After completion of the Lord's Supper, now we're going to offer thanks before we give back as we've been prospered. Let us pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our good fortune to be born into a land where those of almost any skill level can work, career of his choice, job of his choice, and be able to provide for a family and have a reasonable standard of living much higher than that of the whole world. Father, help us to always be grateful for that and always appreciate the things that we're blessed with, but help us to remember that it's all yours and help us to cheerfully give back a portion of that at this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What an incredible morning and of worship, and we're grateful uh, for Mark and all those who helped uh, lead that, and for you, for your participation in the fellowship of worship, and what a treat that is. Um, a couple of announcements that are not in the bulletin. Number one, the for Forever Young uh, group will be meeting this morning directly after a Bible class here in the auditorium. Also, I, I mentioned this earlier, but Tommy Ayers I uh, would like to thank everyone for their thoughts and prayers and cards. He has been moved, and that address will be put in the bulletin uh, next week. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, please stay around for our Bible class hour, which will um, happen right after we dismiss the service. Um, also, this evening at 5 o'clock, we have our Sunday night Bible study, and also on Wednesday nights, we have our midweek study at 6.30, and we invite everybody to attend and hope that you will um, consider doing that. Uh, we will have um, one more song and then a closing prayer to close our service. There is pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful as we approach your throne, realizing you've given us another opportunity to worship you, another opportunity to hear the truth, another opportunity to make our families better. Lord, we thank you for this Midway family and the love we have here and the fact that we can help so many people. This lesson day, let us just put it in our heart and have the courage to go out and preach it. We're already different. And if we condone the actions of the world, we're really not following your instructions. We, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear some more instructions in the Bible class today. 
we're thankful for our good health and continue to pray for those who are not able to be with us today. As we go on through this service, let us always be thankful for your son who died for us. In Jesus' name, amen.